Okay, so I think our, our, our broadcast is live. Uh, Adrian, can you look there and see if you see it uh, being broadcast live? Yeah. All right, that's our friend Adrian Marple, who has uh, been, uh, besides doing amazing research in game theory, making sure that everything uh, works here. So we'll get started. Our uh, This week's uh, Hangout on Air, we have Kevin Layton Brown, Matt Jackson, a whole bunch of uh, guests here. And um, as usual, we'll uh, start by asking Matt uh, where in the world he is. <laughs> I'm, I'm still at the Santa Fe Institute. So I'm an extern external faculty member here, and it's great to uh, spend a little time here. So, Tell us a little about the Santa Fe Institute. What, what goes on there? Well, it's a, it's a great place. It mixes all kinds of uh, researchers. So there's some economists, uh, a lot of people doing game theory, evolutionary biology, uh, physics, anthropology, all kinds of great research and a fun place to come and think. And uh, nature is kind of pretty too, isn't it? Oh, it's gorgeous. If you like hiking, it's beautiful. And this time of year, uh, Taos is what, one hour away? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do some skiing there. <laughs> Kevin, how was uh, Whistler? Oh, it was pretty great. I spent the whole day in the trees. <laughs> I hope not literally. Well, you know, I was pretty close to them, but I uh, didn't hit anything. Um, so I believe there was one issue from the forums that we wanted to pick up, uh, Kevin. Yeah, so I want to uh, explain the difference between incomplete information games and imperfect information games. Um, I think in uh, one video I uh, confused the two, which I am prone to do because they have very similar names, but there's an easy way to remember it. So recall that in the extensive form, we started by talking about perfect information games. Uh, these are extensive form games where players move sequentially and are able to observe everything about the sequence of moves. Uh, then we generalize that to imperfect information extensive form games. Um, uh, or the uh, imperfect extensive form. And uh, in this case, um, players are just entirely unaware of some of the previous things that have happened. So they might have an equivalence class of choice nodes that they're just unable to tell apart. But importantly, they still know exactly uh, what the interests of all the other players are. So they still know what game they're playing, they just don't know what node they're at in the game tree. Uh, this is contrasted with incomplete information games, which actually we'll be looking at next week when we look at Bayesian games. These are games where players don't know something about the game itself that they're playing. So there's uh, something about the interests of the other player or even possibly about their own interests that they're not aware of um, in, until uh, they actually realize their payoffs later in the game. So this distinction will become clearer um, next week once we actually learn about Bayesian games. But at this point, we just want to make clear that uh, imperfect information and incomplete information are different things, even though they sound similar. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and just to be uh, clear, uh, uh, Kevin used the term Bayesian games. Uh, Bayesian games are used interchangeably with games with incomplete information. And, uh, the, and, and that category is distinct from games with imperfect information, as Kevin explained. OK, well, I suggest then, uh, then without further ado, we uh, start having a conversation here. And let's start with uh, Veronica. We'll be going right to left. So Ver Veronica, if you don't mind, unmute your mic and tell us where you're from. OK, I've unmuted it. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, I'm, uh, I'm in Scotland um, doing game theory for the fun of it. Started economics a long time ago, as you probably noticed, before game theory was fashionable. Um, I'm actually interested in the, uh, uh, the political aspects. Um, by that, I mean using game theory uh, to, to make analyses uh, in politics. And I've been looking a bit about, uh, on the internet for that. And there's obviously Bruno de Mesquita, who is, I think, sometimes works not around the corner from you. But presumably with, with politics, the problem is accurately identifying the support. And so far in the course, we've done a lot of um, uh, sort of the rigor and beauty in analyzing the game and how it's played. But if you haven't got your support right, your game is, is worthless. So I'm wondering if there's uh, a lot of research going into the methodology of identifying the support. I'm kind of feeling around here, as you probably guessed from the question. Do you understand where I'm going with it? 
I think so, and we'll talk to it. And if we guess you didn't get it right, then you you can correct us. First of all, I appreciate the Scottish brogue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, of course, modern game theory got a big uh, push in the century uh, in the fifties because of the Cold War. Order, so, so in in some sense, political uh, international politics were main driver of uh, game theory early on in the century. Uh, and still, it continues to be an important application area. Um, Matt, just a heads up, I'm about to ask you to chime in here, but uh, uh, but uh, you, there's sort of two aspects to what you asked. Is first, the application area as such, and second, a specific question about Support and maybe Matt, you can start answering those, and then we can follow up as needed. Sure. So, so I guess you know areas of political science that have been active areas of, of applications of game theory include studies of legislative bargaining, uh, also elections, comp competition in elections, international conflict. There's a whole series of areas where games. Can, can give us a lot of insights. And as you're pointing out, one of the difficulties anytime you're doing modeling, and, and this applies much more broadly than just to game theory, is where do we draw the boundaries of the model? I mean, obviously, we don't want to include everything. We, we can't make the game too complicated, or we can never analyze it. And so there's always a, a difficulty in, in trying to keep the game simple enough that we can actually use it and understand what's going on in it and solve it, and at the same time, have it be broad enough and robust enough that it actually gives real insights into the political phenomenon or social phenomenon or whatever we're, we're actually interested in, in modeling. And, and there's no easy answer to that. And a lot of what happens is people throw out models. They say, okay, I, I want to model how a parliament works. And here, I think, are the essential rules of how, how a parliament works. And then you solve a game looking at that and try and make predictions about its, its functioning. Um, obviously, you miss things. You get things wrong. Somebody tries to build a better model, and so, you know, part of this is science by repetition. So I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. It it, it involves really getting into, into the details and figuring out what fits. Veronica, um, I, is uh, since you asked a broad question, we didn't explicitly mention the support. Is there any follow up you wanted, or is that good enough? Well, no. no one, one thing I was interested actually. I mean. Obviously, with your, with your politics, you would think you'd be easier than many countries. It's Democrat versus Republican. We know that the Koch brothers have spent a lot of money on trying to influence uh, politics in the United States. I just wondered if this was an area in which there's a lot of research going on now, or because, as I say, I've not had an awful lot of success finding stuff on the internet. So, um, so as Matt said, you know, politics is such a broad area. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, really. Difficult. And uh, no, so one can isolate different political phenomena and try to uh, study them, uh, game theoretically or not. Um, I'm personally not aware of a game theoretic analysis of funding of political movements, especially in you know, given legislative uh, sort of developments that allow, you know, PACs and citizens, citizen groups and so on. Uh, you know, what is the equilibrium of funding um, one suggestion I had made in the past that it might be socially efficient to legislate that by all means if you uh, want to fund some political group go ahead but then you're obligated to fund uh, to some extent the opposing political group uh, so if, say, for example you want to support Republicans at X you need to support also Democrats at Y with some exchange rate. Uh, that would ensure that uh, enhance information to the public, in a, uh, but controlling for bias. Uh, um, but I'm not aware of a, of a vigorous debate on this particular topic. Um, I don't know if uh, Matt or Kevin, uh, if you are uh, aware of such work. Hi. Yeah, I think there, there is a literature that e examines things like campaign financing using game theoretic tools. There's also ones uh, looking at PAC rules, other kinds of things. So, so these are out there. Um, there's a number of journals that, that cover this stuff. So, so one would be the 
quarterly journal of political science, you'll find game theoretic models of various things like this in, in that journal. Um, so some of the scientific journals will have models of, of various political uh, processes and, and things like spending, um, how, how do you campaign, how do you choose a platform, uh, what, how many parties does it make sense to have, how does a parliamentary system differ from a uh, uh, say more, more uh, your uh, American legislative system. So there's a whole series of of analyses of these using game theoretic tools, and, and it's a very rich literature. Okay, thanks. Uh, I I've learned from this, uh, Veronica. If you don't mind, uh, mute your mic, mm -hmm. and we'll move on to Ron. Ron, if you can unmute, the floor is yours. Where are you from? Hi there, everyone. Uh, I'm Ron, and I'm located in Toronto in Canada, uh, so say hello to my fellow Canadians, also uh, fellow Kiwis around the world as well. Uh, my question is more about the course itself, and just to get some idea of its positioning. Uh, I'd like to know where it is in relation to uh, a first year or a first semester course in, say, at UBC or at Stanford, and the material that we're covering is this equivalent to one semester, or is it half a semester, is it one and a half semesters? Just want to get some idea of where this fits in with a you know, standard first year course. It's uh, about half a, uh, a half, we, so at Stanford we have a quarter system. It's uh, about half of the quarter worth of material in my class. And the other half, or some of, you know, to some extent, will be covered in a follow-up Online clients will be teaching, so this is actually a good opportunity to also discuss this here in this Hangout. Kevin, how about UBC? Uh, so this course for me is uh, following a graduate class that I'm teaching at UBC. Um, we're doing kind of considerable enrichment stuff in class and much more difficult assignments, but uh, the students are using these lectures as kind of the, the bedrock of that class. So uh, at least in terms of the, the kind of underlying topics, uh, uh, as you have said, we're, this is kind of the first half, and we're going to continue with the uh, follow-on course. So uh, Kevin mentioned the flipped classroom uh, model that we're using also. So the idea is that these uh, lectures uh, are common to both the classes we're teaching at Stanford, and then we have an opportunity to do additional stuff in the relatively small uh, class that we teach in our respective campuses with additional material from uh, guest lectures to interactive exercises to problem solving sessions. Uh, Matt, I believe that you're also uh, 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 will be using this material in some part of your flipped classroom. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's correct. So in the, sp in the springtime, I'll, I'll be teaching an a undergraduate game theory class. And uh, again, I think uh, this, would, this would account for about half of the background material or half of the material of the course and then the the subsequent follow-up course would would cover most of the remaining topics we'll cover so I think the coverage is good and then you know that uh, in an in class you, you you have just a little more time to uh, to okay. dig into things and in these chats Phil is a sub or a, a, a different approach to filling in some of the gaps that we have um, in people's understanding so it's interesting you saw that Kevin's class is purely graduate, uh, um, uh, Matt's class is uh, undergraduate. Mine, interestingly, is sort of in between. I'd say I have close to half the people advanced undergraduates, uh, close to half master student and a smattering of PhD students, uh, for whom this is the first uh, exposure to game theory. Um, so this is also a good time to interject that, the, and there's been some discussion on the forum, and we even set a in response, sent a, a, a notice to people about our upcoming uh, class. So in the spring, we'll be teaching this class again. We actually won't be teaching at Coursera. We're going to uh, uh, so the variety. We're going to teach it uh, uh, on a website hosted at Stanford. And uh, so the technology is very similar. It's powered by both Google and Stanford owns uh, um, a sort of uh, open source software, but you know, the experience will be very similar. And we will teach this class and then immediately follow, on, follow it up with a, uh, a, a class with somewhat more advanced topics. And um, 
you're all, everybody's invited to take, well, either one, in fact. Uh, if for some reason, I know some people didn't manage to finish this class, you can go and register to the next one, uh, and there'll be a fresh start for you. Um, and everybody's invited to take the follow-up class as well. Um, Matt or Kevin, do you want to just say briefly a few words about the topics in the follow-up class? Uh, sure. So, so we'll be looking. You know, game theory takes the game as given and uh, analyzes how how people behave. Uh, one of the topics we'll be covering is is flipping it upside down, mechanism design. Um, so we think about as we vary the game, uh, how will people behave, or if we want certain kinds of outcomes, can we achieve them? Social choice theory. We'll look a little bit at this. We'll also be looking at auctions in in more detail. Um, so there's a number of topics that will use game theory and, and extend a lot of our understanding. So I think, I think uh, uh, our Ron. Indian friend is uh, unmuted. Yeah, Ron, do you mind muting? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure I've left some topics out, but uh, maybe Kevin wants to add something. Yeah, I think that's that's the broad stroke. So we're going to ask questions like, uh, you know, w what's the best way of designing a voting scheme? Is it possible to have a voting scheme that that, that really works sensibly? Or what's what's the best way of allocating something among a set of people if um, if all of them are, are not willing to tell you how much they they want the thing and you're interested in doing it in a sensible way? So we're going to, as Matt said, kind of flip things around and and ask how to design interactions that, that will have good outcomes if we believe that the participants are self-interested. All right, let's just in the interest of time, let's move on. Um, yeah, Peter, you're on. If, uh, please unmute your mic. Tell us where you're from. Right, um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm a newly retired uh, person. I was formerly a general manager of an engineering company here in Sussex, England. Um, it was actually a subsidiary of a US corporation. So um, it wasn't a surprise to me when I started to get time to study that uh, I was doing it with a US university. I've chosen subjects which are challenging and demanding. Game theory is certainly that. And I want to thank you guys for the for the effort you're putting into this course. After five weeks, you three guys feel like old friends. Probably a bit worry. My question today, you, you may really have answered because it's about auction design. Um, I know uh, you're coming up to it on the next course, and I, but I didn't know that when I decided to ask this today. Game theorists uh, famously helped the UK government make $22 billion on the auction of 3G spectrum rights. And uh, as a former economist like Veronica, I've always wondered how they did it. Can you give us a clue, uh, an advertisement for the next course? Uh, a fascinating topic, and all three of us have been involved in one way or another in high stakes uh, commercial auctions uh, from government to corporations. Electric electromagnetic spectrum is an example. Energy uh, is another. Um, the uh, it's interesting that initially the uh, impetus uh, for these auctions wasn't to maximize revenue for the government, but to maximize social efficiency. Uh, the uh, idea being that the corporation willing to spend most is the corporation that will do the most with it and bring the most social value. Once it became clear that we're talking billions of dollars, then uh, you know things got interesting. Uh, there's many war stories here, some good, some bad, and just in, uh, Kevin, you're actually involved in in a related effort now, aren't you? Um, yeah, that's right. Actually, in two weeks, I'm going to be at Stanford for a, a conference the FCC is hosting on on the next round. Um, maybe I'll come by and say hi. But, uh, but, but yeah, indeed. I, I think that the really short answer to the question is that uh, it, it unlocked the value that was already there. And the companies really valued the, the spectrum at a huge amount, and the previous allocation process just didn't really have a way of tapping into that value. So I think they, they designed uh, allocation rules that made it more possible for people to really express the preferences that they did have and to really compete with each other uh, uh, for the things that they wanted. And that those large payouts were, uh, in some, to some extent, really just reflective of how much people cared about the spectrum. 
The only other thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention now that one fascinating uh, aspect of, of the uh, Spectrum auctions is they demonstrate very clearly that we often think uh, about auction as one thing. Oh, auction is eBay, or auction is Sotheby's, or auction is NASDAQ. But in fact, the space of auctions is, is infinitely rich. And especially when the stakes are high, there's incentive to design an auction that matches the domain well. And uh, in many ways, Spectrum Auctions gave a, a big push to auction uh, research uh, around the world. But uh, so thank you for asking it. It is a topic for the next class, and uh, maybe enough for this topic for now. Thank you. Uh, so Peter, if you don't mind, mute your mic again, uh, and we'll move on to Omar. Omar, please unmute. Tell us where you're from. Omar, I don't know if you're trying to unmute, but you haven't. Can you hear me? Um, we'll give you another chance. I see you're trying to do something. Hello? Hi, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Where are you from, Omar? Uh, I'm from Egypt, and I'm studying mechanical engineering in UAE. And I have an interest in robotics, so I have a question about uh, real-world situation. How do we precisely uh, assign payoff for each player? I mean, for example, in the goalie kicker example, we use statistics to assign payoff. Uh, but how about uh, complex situation? Is there a specific methodology for assigning payoff for each and player? Fascinating question, Matt. Uh, you know, payoffs are as mysterious. Or even more mysterious than probabilities, aren't they? Where do they come from? Yeah, so that's that's uh, a fairly. Uh, you, you've touched on probably one of the more interesting active debates in in uh, in game theory now, and you know sometimes it's easy to see what the material payoffs are, but it's also difficult to know what actually motivates pay players. So when we put numbers into a matrix, it's important that those are the the numbers that represent what players are paying attention to. And there's all kinds of things that enter into it. In, in a game like soccer, it's fairly clean and fairly easily uh, modeled. We, we assume that each player wants to win, and they get to pay off a positive if they win and negative if they lose. And you know, we can normalize those. If we're talking about uh, you know uh, bidding, say in a in a spectrum auction, we have to figure out what companies are going to earn from it. How it depends on combinations of what companies win which different uh, locations and what the competition is going to be downstream, how they might take advantage of this over the years, what, what are the risks. Those numbers are very, very uh, difficult to estimate and, and people spend a lot of time estimating them. So there's no easy answer other than you know, looking at exactly at the situation you're, you're interested in, trying to make sure what are people paying attention to, and then rolling up your sleeves and, and doing the best you can uh, at, at, at filling in numbers. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Omar. Uh, please um, mute, uh, mute your mic again, and we'll move on to, uh, is it Gemma or Gemma? It's uh, Gemma. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Where are you from? I, well, I am from Barcelona, and I moved to Bellevue, Washington, three months ago. Uh, welcome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And well, my answer is about, I would like to add, about asymmetric information. So when you, uh, you are building your model just to, well, to, to take a decision in the company, just to, for example, to, if you, sorry for the cat. <laughs> 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 we move to the cat too. Um, if you want to make a model to, to make a campaign or to make a decision if you had to add uh, or not to add. Uh, so um, you, may uh, you may have some information but uh, that other companies maybe don't have. So how can you build a, a model um, where you have some information and, but you are not sure about the information that the other ones may have. So you know it's how uh, maybe you have to infer to just to make some predictions before Should taking be, a decision. 
Kevin, you seem to be our Bayesian game guy for the day. You want to take it? Sure. So the first thing I should say is I've got a cat right here, so I understand <laughs> what, what uh, the problems that you're facing in the participating <laughs> the video chat. Uh, wait, I got I I, I have a, a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't climb into your lab. Well, I have two other more cats, but they are hidden. <laughs> But, but to respond to your question, uh, this is a perfect setup for the topic of our, uh, our course next week. So uh, these uh, games of incomplete information that I was just speaking about, or Bayesian games, uh, are really for modeling precisely what you're asking about. So uh, they're really exactly about asymmetric information. So uh, the whole idea is that different players might know different things about the game being played. They might know uh, more about their own interests than the interests of the other player. They might have some kind of private information that's relative, uh, relevant to the payoffs. And uh, the, the whole idea about Bayesian games is, is thinking about how to act strategically, um, given uh, that the game is a little bit more complicated that way. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you got anything you want to show us? <laughs> no, sorry. I, no, no cats here. There is no a cat, cat at, at the institute, but uh, mm -hmm. she, she tends to sleep and, and hide a lot. <laughs> no prairie dog running around there? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but Gemma, the, uh, uh, we mentioned earlier auctions. Um, those are prime examples of where you have asymmetric information, right? You know what the item is worth to you, or maybe you do, or maybe you don't. And you may have some guesses about what is worth to others. You may have some guesses about what they think it's worth to you. And all of that plays in how you analyze the auction. So that will be an example. Um, but thanks for the question. Hopefully uh, next week then will be re uh, relevant to you. OK, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, please mute your mic, and we'll move on to Bruno. You're not really from Albuquerque, right? No, no, I'm not really from Albuquerque. Where are you um, from? Can you hear me? We can. Where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Brasilia. From Brasilia, specifically? Yeah, specifically. It's the okay. capital of Brazil. Many people don't know that. <laughs> no, we know. Um, well, uh, and my original question was about, it is about, um, uh, Attitude towards risk, and uh, as reflected in the utility function, and um, mixed strategies. I mean, um, I, I, when I say attitude towards risk, I don't mean um, attitude towards uh, um, abstractly um, riskier, um, riskier, how to say, what well, uh, strategy or, or something like that. I mean, in the in the way economists. And define it as as like um, when you're the 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 expectation of your your of your utility is not equal to the the utility of the expected returns, because it seems to me that when you are um, when you're defining mixed mixed strategies, um, you, you're you're impl implicitly assuming um, a, a risk neutral agent. Because um, when you when you because it, uh, you you sum the you multiply the utilities by by a uh, uh, by a, a probability and uh, uh, effect, effectively um, turning it into a random variable and you you just sum the the the, the this um, ex and just take the the expectation of this probability, but it shouldn't. It, 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 if you have a risk neutral agent, for instance, um, the the um, uh, the expectation of your of your utility exposed is not is not the same as the uh, uh, utility of the expected return. So I, I would like to know how do you model uh, how how to take it into account when you have a mixed strategy. Um, when you're looking at mixed strategies, uh, different attitudes start risk other than risk neutrality. Okay, Bruno, thank you. Uh, a very uh, uh, intelligent and, uh, and knowledgeable question. Uh, thank you. Matt, do you want to uh, address? First of all, sure. probably not everybody on the call 
uh, or viewing it remembers uh, what risk-seeking and risk-averse agents are and take it right. from there? Sure. So, so you know, one thing that's important and we, we have not spent a, a lot of time on is what are the numbers that we fill in as payoffs for any particular set of actions. And um, these don't necessarily have to be actual wealth numbers or, or payoff numbers. They can be the utility function of wealth. And so the, the, you know, the basic question underlying this in terms of risk attitudes would be you know, something like um, one strategy might give me uh, $100 for sure, another strategy might give me zero with some probability, and 1,000 with some other probability. Now, not everybody, depending on how much risk you're willing to bear, maybe you want the $100 for sure, even if there's a high likelihood on the 1,000, but uh, a reasonable likelihood you're going to get zero. So exactly how you value that is not captured by putting in a hundred in one for, for one action and zero and a thousand for another, but putting in the fact that um, I'm not going to value a thousand as much as somebody else. So, so the utility function uh, is, is what goes in there. And you know this takes us way back in terms of game theory. So von Neumann and Morgenstern, some of the first uh, important theorems that they did in game theory was developing representation of preferences that allows us to do exactly what we do in terms of writing the games down the way we do. And so there's a, there's a lot of hidden assumptions that we haven't talked about. Um, and it's a, it's a very rich topic, a great topic. Um, we haven't had enough time to cover, uh, but it's an excellent question and, and a deep one in terms of exactly how one represents this. Bruno, is there any uh, anything uh, that you want to quickly follow up on, or did it sufficiently address your question? Yes, I, I, I would just like to know um, where can I where can I find some material on that? I, I'm already um, already reading Kevin's um, Moody Agent Systems uh, Handbook. Uh, it, it's it's a great book, by the way. I got the the um, the version the the uh, ebook version for free, uh, and I would like to buy it on Kindle or something. Also, I, I would like to know uh, how can I buy it on Kindle, and um, uh, and also I, I would like to know if if uh, where, where, if you you treat this you delve into this issue in this book or where I can get some more information about it. Kevin, let's do this. I actually, uh, as I, t I said, I need to sign off. So why don't you take the follow-up question? And I unfortunately will have to miss uh, Akshay's question later on. I'll bid you all goodbye and see you next week. Goodbye. Take care, you all. Actually, let me take this question. Let me first point out that uh, the, the book you're attributing to me is uh, joint with Yoav, so uh, uh, I, I don't recall it my book. Um, well, you know, he just uh, he, he worked hard on the book, so he deserves uh, his glory. But uh, but yes, this is certainly something we talk about in the book. Uh, let me just expand a little bit on what what Matt said. Um, it, it's a theorem from uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern, which uh, indeed we uh, prove in the book. Um, that uh, anybody who has a, a preference ordering which be, uh, follows certain axioms, um, so a kind of a well-behaved preference ordering, um, yeah. must have a utility function. Um, and they care about maximizing the expectation of that utility function. So they, they really are, they, they really do just care about the average. They don't, they don't have some more kind of subtle um, way of sort of reasoning yeah. about risk. Um, but importantly, this is how they feel about their utility function. This is not necessarily how they feel about lotteries over amounts of money, which is what Matt was getting at. So the, the kind of important takeaway is you can't just take what happens to you in terms of money and understand that to be your utility. It might be that the way you value money is quite different from the way you value utility. And that kind of makes sense that if you sort of think, if somebody proposed to double your wealth, that you would probably feel you know, like that was a really different thing from somebody giving you, say, 2,000 times as much wealth. That wouldn't make you 2,000 times as happy. It would make you probably more happy, but it, it wouldn't change your life as much as the first doubling would change your life. So, so it must be that the way we feel about money isn't quite expressed in units of utility. Uh, so in the book, in the mechanism design section, um, we do talk about risk attitudes, and, 
essentially the way that it gets modeled by economists is to think that there's some mapping between money and utility, and that mapping is probably not linear. Decreasing returns, for instance. That's right. So, so uh, different people might feel differently. Uh, you know, if, if, for example, um, you're in debt to the mob, and they're going to you know, kill you if you can't come up with a certain amount of money by next week, you might not have decreasing returns. You might be kind of all or nothing about getting that amount of money. So, so different people might feel differently, but uh, the important thing is that, that units of uh, currency and utility are really not the same thing. Uh, I don't know, if Matt. You want to uh, come back to that again? Or? Right. Exactly. And, and I, I think just to, you know, the, as, as Kevin is saying, the, it, it's important to remember what's what's actually in the matrix is is some payoff to the individual in terms of utility, not payoff yes. in terms of uh, some material goods, right? And 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 that that that's what allows all of this to work the way it does. Yeah, but if the agent isn't risk neutral, you can't just um, multiply the payoffs by the probabilities and then um, sum them up. If they're not risk neutral, you can when as long as you're putting in their utility numbers, not their payoff, yes. not payoffs in terms of materials. And so when we talk about payoffs in in quotes, we're really talking about utilities, not material numbers. And so you're right; you can't okay. put wealth numbers in there. You have to put, as Kevin was saying, how the person values that wealth. And as long as you do that, then the attitudes of risk can be incorporated by putting in a diminishing returns utility function, a concave utility function, will capture that. Okay. All right. Uh, so thanks. So uh, please, uh, Bruno, mute your mic. And uh, I guess we'll move on to our last question from uh, Ashka. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ashke. I, I'm probably saying your name wrong. Hello. So Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. It's Ashke. Yeah. Great. So tell us where you're from, and uh, let's hear what your question is. Uh, hello, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, India. Uh, and uh, my question was related to uh, application of game theory to topics other than economics or politics. That is uh, like evolutionary genetics or animal behavior. Uh, could you tell more about it? Hello? Hello? Yeah, we missed the last part of your question. Yeah. Hello? Yes, the last part uh, of your question was... I was wondering if you, if you could tell a little more uh, about it. Uh, just a minute. So it looks like Akshay is typing something to us. Uh, we'll wait just a moment to see what it is. Okay, so he's asking about uh, game theory applied to genetics, biology, and animal behavior. Um, surely something Matt has something to say about. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, one of the, the benefits of being at the Santa Fe Institute is we get to hear a, a lot about what's going on in evolutionary biology and, and also anthropology and other areas. And in particular, there's a way, you know, we, in terms of the way the course has worked, we've been thinking of a particular player choosing optimally and, and rationally optimizing to maximize payoffs. But one can also think about uh, evolutionary systems where instead you have populations of players and they're interacting and the populations reproduce themselves depending on what the payoffs are. So if you get a higher payoff then that increases what's known as your fitness or your re reproductive success so that you're more likely to reproduce and uh, your population grows. And so they look at systems like that where over time the, you look at different populations trying different strategies and you can see which strategies are going to be the ones that end up growing in terms of having larger populations that represent them. You can look at a whole series of dynamic systems. It's a very active area of biology and, and makes predictions about animal behavior over time, um, selections of different animals, which ones are going to survive, how that depends on ecosystems. Uh, it's also being used and applied to uh, human systems, looking at cities, looking at large societies, trying to understand how societies evolve. 
So it's a, it's a very uh, great question and, and uh, a nice application and, and interesting area of game theory. Thank you. Thanks, Akshay. Uh, so please mute your mic. And uh, Matt, I guess at this point we should sign off. Yes, so thanks everybody. This was a, a wonderful set of questions today. It's great to, to see people from all over the world taking our course and enjoying things. Great. Uh, thanks everybody, and uh, we'll uh, see you in the upcoming lectures and uh, maybe in a, a future chat. Thanks Thank you. Yep. Take care, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, folks. Bye bye.